So welcome all. It is my pleasure to welcome you to this year's Sterling Lecture. The Graham L. Sterling Memorial Award was established in 1972 in memory of former college trustee Graham Sterling. Occidental awards the Sterling Prize each year to a professor with a distinguished record of teaching, service, and professional achievement. After the award is officially bestowed, the winner of the Sterling Award is invited to give a research talk, which is a highlight of the academic year. It is my sincere pleasure to introduce this afternoon's Sterling Lecture delivered by Professor Anthony Chase, Professor of Diplomacy and World Affairs, the 2022 recipient of the Sterling Award. For many of you, Anthony needs no introduction. He has been a member of the Oxy faculty for two decades. Anthony declined a Fulbright Fellowship to join the Oxy faculty in the fall of 2003, fresh from his postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Chicago. He received his bachelor's in politics and French studies from the University of, University of California at Santa Cruz, a master's in Islamic culture studies at Columbia, and a second master's and PhD in international law and diplomacy from the Fletcher School at Tufts University. Several of Anthony's colleagues nominated him for the Sterling Award on the basis of his record of excellent teaching, stellar scholarly accomplishments, and dedicated service to our community. Anthony's work shows how international human rights norms resonate in the Muslim world. As his nominators write, his publication record has established him as the leading scholar of human rights in the Middle East and North Africa. Anthony's work has appeared in some of the most important outlets in his discipline. He has authored or edited three books on human rights in the Arab world, 15 peer-reviewed articles and chapters, and a host of presentations, workshops, symposia, articles, essays, reviews, board memberships, media appearances, and blog posts that reflect his expertise and stature in the field, both nationally and internationally. Despite Anthony's prominence as a scholar, he embodies all of the qualities we value as a teacher. I took the opportunity to look back on student feedback submitted for Anthony's full professor review to gain some insight. What I learned is that Anthony's students are enormously grateful to him for his commitment, for his commitment to them, for his commitment to his courses, and his commitment to the liberal arts. Students report on Anthony's investment in them as humans, interested in their background, interests, and lived experiences. He opens up new worlds and new opportunities to his, to his students, and they are grateful for that. Anthony is currently bringing new meaning to the college's place-based educational approach by expanding opportunities for students involved in the task force class in partnership with the mayor's office. His nomination letter described these opportunities as confronting the three-dimensional social reality of a large, unequal, and complex community like Los Angeles, I thought that was very well <laughs> <laughs> And beyond that, we can talk about Anthony's contributions to faculty governance and the health of the college. Again, I'll quote from his nomination letter. Not only has he previously served on important elected committees, but in his two years as faculty president, from 2015 to 2017, Anthony led us through a turbulent period with energy, vision, and good humor. His colleagues applaud his service in support of the DWA department, serving for many years as its chair, and recently becoming the Interim Young Initiative Chair on the Global Political Economy, the, the Interim Young Initiative Chair on the Global Political Economy. In this role, Anthony broadened young programming in ways that reflect his commitment to the whole campus, to all students, to interdisciplinarity, and to social justice. In short, Anthony Chase is a creative and internationally renowned scholar a passionate teacher and a dedicated colleague, all of which make clear why he is especially deserving of the Sterling Award. <laughs> Thanks. That was just way, way, way too kind. Um, <laughs> but so nice to nice to see you all all here. Um, so first, I just have to say say thank you to, to so many people. I'm really impressed, slightly intimidated. <laughs> 
by the list of people who've won this award before, many of whom are, are in the room. Um, so that's just amazing. So I, I really thank Wendy, but all the members of Advisory Council for flattering me by including me in, in that list. Um, I'm also grateful to so many colleagues for being here, colleagues who are friends, uh, friends who are, who are not colleagues, but, but are particularly <laughs> dear to me, um, and especially to, to so many of my family members who have, have come, some of them by surprise, Katie. Um, <laughs> so nice to see you. Um, it, it really is incredibly meaningful to me to have you, have you all here. Um, and lastly, I just wanted to thank my colleagues, both in the Young Initiative as well as in the Department of Diplomacy and World Affairs, for all, how we all intersect in terms of encouraging eclectic scholarship, which is something that I think we really have to be grateful to Occidental College for encouraging so much. Um, especially, I just wanted to single out the DWA, Diplomacy and World Affairs. We're really lucky to have a department that encourages challenging scholarship, that pushes borders, that tries to break down borders, which is not the norm in the academic world. We have an academic world that's based in the idea of, of disciplines, those arbitrary academic walls that, that surround us. Those disciplinary walls theoretically focus our work, um, but with that disciplinary focus, they also limit our, our, our vision, a vision that's really desperately needed in, in current days. So I'm super grateful to be part of a department um, that consistently challenges those walls. So all that said, I, I gave the, the, the talk, the, the title that's on the, on the screen, we have a thousand lives out of which we choose one. Uh, a Dutch poet uh, wrote that, sort of a poetic way, much more poetic than I could be, uh, saying that out of all the twists and possibilities and, and sometimes seemingly random turns, what are the through lines that inform academic choices that I've made? And to be honest, I, I came up with that title well before I put this talk together, not quite knowing where it would go, because um, it is a bit odd to be tasked with talking about one's own uh, research work. But in pulling my thoughts together, it occurred to me that maybe there is a connecting through line in terms of what I just mentioned about diplomacy and world affairs, this notion of challenging walls. So I just want to reflect tonight on the ways at the beginning, uh, the middle, and now towards the end of my career, I've attempted in some small way to challenge those academic walls that, that surround us both figuratively as well as literally. So let me start with two stories to give a sense of where I'm coming from, bookend stories from when I entered uh, academia to, to where I've been much more recently. One from, from the start is how I got started doing my, my graduate studies with a focus on, on the Middle East. I always had a sense um, that I do a PhD in political philosophy that yeah, somewhere along the line got, got disposed of. Um, but before doing a PhD in political philosophy, I wanted to get a, a master's degree, specifically a master's that would give me a grounding in a region where religion was seen as important, such as Latin America in terms of Catholicism. And, and there was a reason for that. Um, Wendy, I think, mentioned that I was an undergrad at, up at UC Santa Cruz. Um, and I, I, I really remember being in classrooms and just adoring my, my professors as they talked about the Greeks or Foucault or whoever it might be. And then all of a sudden, they, they, they would seem so sophisticated and then so simplistic when they were trying to translate that to contemporary, contemporary everyday politics, specifically in terms of, of Latin America, which those of my age will recall was the center of, of the tension and protest in terms of the US role there back, back in the day when I was a college student. Um, so having had a fair amount of exposure to Latin America as I grew up, I had a sense that their theoretical sophistication didn't necessarily translate to helpful insight into on the ground realities in that part of the world or really any part of the world. So naturally, given the, the Colombian background of my family, I thought I'd do a, a master's in, in Latin American studies. Um, and I was living at the time in New York, so Columbia, the university, not the, not the country, uh, had an interdisciplinary master's program with a regional focal point that, that appealed to me as a way to complement my, my interest in political philosophy. But when I talked to the, the counselor there, um, I, I found that they didn't actually, even though they had these regional specializations, they didn't have a specialization in Latin America, but they did have one on, on the Middle East. And I simply thought, really, literally, almost on the spot, you know, that makes sense, that the region itself wasn't so much the point. It was more the desire to combine theorizing with a deeper on-the-ground knowledge of a particular area, one in which religion was key. And so that's really where the focus on the Middle East started. In some sense, it was a, a random decision. But in retrospect, maybe projecting back, it also had a certain logic, a, a logic that's continued, in wanting to combine, integrate theorizing with tangible on-the-ground realities, and sensing 
that I didn't need to limit myself to one region in order to do that, and in wanting an interdisciplinary master's program rather than studying within one particular set of academic walls. So I think all that flowed out as some inchoate sense the usual borders in academia were insufficient, that even at that early point, I recognized some discomfort with those disciplinary walls that I mentioned, uh, mentioned before. So that's the first story. The second to bookend that uh, with is, is really where I'm at right now. Um, and uh, let me see if this works. Yes. Um, you know, these are, these are uh, this refers to the three logos that are, that are up on the screen. And this past summer, not long after Wendy let me know, that, that I'd been awarded this prize. I was overseas for an editorial meeting of Rock Arabi, and for my hotel room on, on Zoom calls, one after the other, with the board of Proceso Pacifico, and then the steering committee of the U.S. Human Rights Cities Alliance. Rock Arabi, maybe I should say, is a peer-reviewed journal that comes out of the Cairo Institute for Human Rights Studies, um, one of the Arab, uh, Arab uh, human rights NGOs with which I've had the longest engagement. Uh, Proceso Pacifico coordinates community-led truth processes across Mexico and Colombia, and hopefully, possibly, we'll, we'll be working with them here in Los Angeles as well. And the U.S. Human Rights Cities Alliance pushes for U.S. city governments to short-circuit our federal government's reluctance to engage with human rights by conceptualizing how human rights-based law and norms can be implemented at the city level rather than the traditional focus on state government. So it just struck me in that hotel room, you know, how did I end up here? This is, this is kind of crazy. Coming in and out of meetings with Arab human rights intellectuals and Zooming uh, with young Latin American activists and academics and going into a meeting with U.S. colleagues with the U.S. Uh, human rights cities alliance. You know, Middle East, U.S., Latin America, those at least in academic terms are generally seen as pretty distinct areas of, of study, right? So it's a bit odd to be going back and forth uh, between them. So it occurred then in that faceless hotel room. Um, that would be the puzzle I, I might want to explore a bit with you all tonight. I'm talking about my research journey and about how those disparate worlds, distinct regions came to intersect with my own work. Um, and of course, as I mentioned, the challenges that have come with that. Um, so um, I've obviously focused um, on a, <laughs> a little inside joke there. Um, I've obviously focused on, on human rights as a, as a professor here at, at Occidental, but it actually took me a, a, a bit of a, a winding path to get to human rights as a focal point. Um, so Wendy mentioned I, 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 I went to, to Columbia, uh, the university, um, to get a second master's. Uh, at, excuse me, after that I got a second master's at Fletcher and then my PhD, all with a focus in one way or another on international relations, international law, and the, and the Middle East. Uh, so, so I let go of the, of the philosophy conceit. Um, but I was wary of, of studying human rights, and, and that was for two very specific reasons. One was just personal. Um, my wife, Sophia, hello, um, was already an active human rights lawyer and scholar, so on a personal level, who wants to be in the same field as one's partner? <laughs> <laughs> Particularly when she's smarter and better than I am and, and all that. Much more disciplined, that's for certain. Um, but two, beyond the, the personal, like many of you, I'm sure, while not I wasn't yet a scholar of human rights, I certainly absorbed the general sense, particularly prevalent among academics, that human rights were Western and not really so relevant to the peoples, the cultures of the Middle East, the Arab world. So in short, I really didn't see any natural connection between my studies of the Middle East to human rights. So when I, when I engaged with my PhD, I really had no intention of, of engaging in, in human rights. But so here I am, uh, what changed? What changed was, was really simply living in the Arab world, studying Arabic in Syria and in Egypt, doing research in those two countries, as well as later, both researching and working in, in Israel, Palestine, in Yemen. And living in, in the Arab world led me to challenge those predominant academic assumptions that I had absorbed through, you know, through many experiences. But let me just specify two different sets of experiences. Again, one was personal, simply conversations. The idea that human rights is a Western discourse irrelevant on the ground in the Middle East or the Arab world or the Muslim world, however you want to divide things up, it became a bit silly when it was constantly being raised from the ground up in conversations on the street, in, in tea houses, as in, in this photo that, 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 that I took in Cairo and that um, Vindy Reddy's husband altered in an in a arty sort of way. And, and let me just, just give one story in that regard. Um, while I was studying Arabic in Damascus, I went to, uh, to Palmyra to this really beautiful site of, of Roman ruins in the southeast of, of, of Syria. 
and I, there, there's a bus stop apparently, I, I don't actually know this because <laughs> I missed it, but there's a bus stop at the, at, the, at, the, at the ruins, but I landed a little bit further on in the nearby village of, of Tadmur, actually the whole, in Arabic, the whole region is called Tadmur. Um, and as in the case, uh, as this is the case in the Arab world, this really wasn't much of a problem. Um, people were very kind, led me to, in the right direction, to some cousin's house, put me in a car, took me closer to, to the ruins, uh, dropped me off at, at another person's house who eventually led me to, to the ruins, which was all, all very lovely, and pretty lovely to be treated to tea and, and conversation at each stop along the way. But those conversations, the reason I, I raised them in, in Todd Moore as, as elsewhere, were really very often about pent-up political frustrations, sometimes general, but sometimes explicitly in the language of rights, be it the rights of the Palestinians, not surprising that would get raised in the Arab world, but also often, you know, I remember very, someone very plaintively saying, why just Palestinians? Why do we talk about their rights? What about our rights here in, 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 in Syria, rights to food or housing or political voice or, or simply not to be tortured? And what that made that all the more striking in, in retrospect, and the reason I single out that set of conversations among many is that I was later to find out that those conversations were taking place in the shadow of Tadmor Prison, which is known as the worst prison in the world. Um, and when it was taken over by uh, Islamists during the Civil War, was performatively blown up uh, because, of course, many of them had been, along with other people, subject to truly gruesome, indescribable torture in, in, in I don't know who awarded it the, the prize of being the worst prison uh, in, in the world, but, uh, but nonetheless, the stories are, are, are pretty pretty uh, stomach churning. Um, so that's a way of saying that the first turn of my head towards human rights was, shall we say, less academic and more, more visceral, more personal, from just having had them raised in conversations in ways that surprised me. The second was, you'll, you'll, you'll be glad to know, a little bit more academic. It had to do with my doctoral research, which, as I mentioned, had originally had little to do with, with human rights, but was about comparative Islamic law and international law, um, a subject about which I've pretty much forgotten everything, so, so don't ask me about it. Um, but as I, as I was researching uh, uh, about Islamic law and international law, I began connecting to the academics, others engaging with that field in the Arab world. And I often found that that slid into conversations about human rights, it began to kind of suck me into this field that I'd sort of been resisting. It began to connect me to the reality that not just that political frustrations on the street might be sort of expressed in language that referenced in, in a general sense human rights, but that the predominant non-Islamist opposition to the authoritarian status quo in the Arab world was very much consciously informed by, by human rights. And that led to a basic question for me. How could I not just be working on my PhD, but also already have received two master's degrees from highfalutin institutions dealing with Middle East politics, and never even really received a hint of how much churning discourse in the Arab world was explicitly centered on human rights. And, and that led to the beginnings of a recognition that I wanted to challenge the status quo of academic discourse in that regard. It seemed to me there was something very wrong in Western academic uh, work, um, and frankly still is something very wrong uh, with, with, with Western academic work that would leave that sort of gap in my education. We're talking, in short, about academic insularity, theoretical assumptions too often taking precedence over lived realities on the ground. So to go back to the metaphor of walls, theory that puts walls over what we're allowed to study creates blind spots in the sense that it narrows what we're allowed to see and engage with or not engage with in terms of human rights. And it made me begin to wonder in terms of human rights, what was the imposition in terms of discussing or engaging in human rights academically? Or was it an imposition to arrogantly refuse to do so? I do think it's problematic to ignore human rights, as too many academics were doing, especially when working in a country like Syria, in which the rights violations were an obvious, brutal, everyday reality. So that led to a side project that I began working on as I was working on my dissertation, a side project that eventually took over my academic career, I guess, um, which uh, uh, eventually resulted in, in, in this particular book, um, Human Rights in the Arab World, Independent Voices. I had to check the cover because I forgot the title. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, um, but, uh, but Independent Voices was really a way to, to channel the frustration I felt into a challenge to the status quo in my field. 
I may also have just been a way to procrastinate as I should have been writing my dissertation. We've all been there. Um, but let me just make a, a few points about um, the book, which, if I recall correctly, came out uh, the first year or maybe a year after I'd been here at Occidental. But in any case, the, the, the first point is for the first time, the idea was to bring out in English the voices of intellectuals, activists, academics from the Arab world debating the role of human rights in Arab world politics. If there was academic discussion of human rights in the Arab world in the US European academic literature, it was really limited to a very basic question, if human rights could be relevant. Independent voices try to go beyond that overly basic question by engaging with the reality that local debates about human rights were already raging around the region. No one was politely waiting for permission from elite Western academics to engage. The debate was not if, but how human rights had relevance. So the book tried to give a platform to voices that signaled the sorts of specific rights demands and critiques that were circulating under the surface of seemingly passive societies. Um, contributors came from different parts of the Arab world. They included, as you can see, the, the co-editor, Amr Hamzawi, um, went on after the Arab Spring to be the head of Egypt's Freedom Party um, and head of the Human Rights Committee in the Egyptian Parliament. And in some alternative universe, um, there were some sort of rumors or uh, uh, notions at some point that he might become uh, president of, of Egypt in, during the heyday of the Arab Spring, um, which I just thought would have been a kick to have uh, my co-author be, be president of Egypt. Instead, of course, like most human rights people, he ended up in exile, first in Germany and then in the United States. Uh, he is actually now back in, in Egypt working in politics there again. Um, so that's one point I wanted to make in terms of the book. The, the second is really about this, this eternal theme of Islam and, and, and human rights. In, in general, the contributors to the book, without getting into the specifics, paired critiques of US-supported dictators with critiques of the dominant uh, Islamist opposition, arguing that Islamist emphasis on singular religious nationalism ignored, denied the region's inherent pluralism, be that pluralism ethnic or ideological or sexual. That, in short, unlike Islamist, human rights-informed analyses saw a necessity to come to terms with that pluralism rather than deny it, which is you know, not unlike other parts of the world, right? Um, so I frame this in the intro to, to the book not as sort of an opposition, a binary opposition between Islam and human rights, but rather that a false binary had been, constrict, had been constructed between Islam and human rights. And you know, just to be clear, Islam isn't inherently anything. It's not inherently contrary to human rights, though it's often, of course, constructed as such that can also be constructed as supportive and more often as some sort of complex mix. And that's not unlike the relationship of religion and human rights in most any other part of the world. Um, what was amazing was to see that many of the, the contributors like Amr Hamzawi, who I just mentioned, were key figures in the Arab Spring uh, revolutions that broke out a few years later in 2011, 2012. Um, when that explosion occurred with dictators People's revolutions had arisen out of the frustrations at systemic violations of economic and political rights, among other factors. And, you know, that was somewhat frustrating because, of course, it really wasn't that surprising if one had been paying attention. Um, but beyond that, it connects to a larger point in terms of the theme of this talk, challenging traditional walls that keep us from seeing reality around us. The Arab Spring shouldn't have been a surprise, and it only was to many because of theoretical blinders that told academics that those sorts of uprisings weren't conceivable in the Muslim Arab world, a region of supposed cultural authoritarianism, in the title of a book by one author uh, before the Arab Spring. And, and so I'm very, part, very glad to have been a part of challenging that status quo uh, with, with, with my Independent Voices book. Um, the, 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 where, uh, if, if one is going to recognize the ability of people to want change even under superficially placid surfaces of authoritarian state societies, we also know the ability of elites to crush those, re re uh, those revolutions. And I'll admit it was depressing to see their revolutions distorted, co-opted, and eventually crushed um, in the face of, of harsh crackdowns against many of the foremost leaders of the Arab Spring, including advocates for human rights, including many friends, the question that remained and that perhaps became even more essential was both simple and controversial, how to, how to justify human rights. And that's the question that came to a head uh, in these two books as well as the, the article that I, that I have on screen. Uh, 
And I guess that's what I'd say was the second challenge I, I tried to take up, the, the challenge to the status quo thought in my field. The first challenge was to the notion that we should ignore human rights currents in the Arab world and the Arab world as they're seen to be inauthentic. The, the second challenge standard ways of justifying human rights. Theoretical debates around human rights in the academy had never really made much sense to me. It's part of the fabric of studying human rights in the academy is to debate philosophical versus legal versus ideological versus historical justifications for rights. But those, those debates always struck me as utterly alien to the reality of what really compelled human rights groups on the ground in the Arab world and elsewhere. For a while, that just seemed to me to be something to, to shrug off, but I increasingly saw in the midst of increasingly heated debates about human rights, the idea that we need to identify a defined foundation to justify human rights is something that needed to be challenged. That an understanding of human rights is a given specific thing based in a particular origin story isn't just wrong, it's also essentialist, it's also misleading. Misleading in the sense that it takes our eyes off of what really matters in terms of impelling uh, human rights claims. And the argument, uh, specifically in, 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 in the article, but, but throughout the, those two books as well, in very short, draws from Richard Rorty, Salih Ben Habib, um, two philosophers, so I didn't entirely lose a little touch of philosophy in my, in my work. Um, but Rorty and Ben Habib inform an argument for what was called an anti-foundationalist way of looking at human rights, that human rights strength is not from some origin source, but rather from being continuously reimagined, reinvented in the hands of different peoples, in different historic contexts, in different locales who are confronting structural violence in different ways. In short, contingent shifting circumstances have flowed into creating a human rights regime that should not be constrained by a notion of an origin story. And just to make that more, more tangible, to be alive and not dead letter Geneva treaty law, Human rights have to always be changing, always have to be recreated in the hands of groups around the world if they're going to make sense to those groups. If they're not changing, they're dying. Um, and there's, there's a quote from, from, from the book, uh, which I think epitomizes that idea that globally diverse actors not only shape and reconfigure existing human rights to fit their needs, but trigger the creation of entirely new human rights internationally. And what that means is that human rights should really be seen as, as two things, as I often tell my, tell my students. <laughs> you may have heard this before. Um, the human rights should be seen as, as, as two things. Uh, human rights are a tool of struggle and, and a site of struggle. A tool of struggle in a way that, that a story that's always stuck, stuck with me indicates. Um, and it was from when I was working in, in, in Yemen. Uh, Amal Basha is a, a Yemeni human rights activist. And she told me that when she started her activism, it was really about the rights, of, about the situation of, of female prisoners in in Yemeni jails. Um, and she, she didn't know what human rights were, and it didn't really concern her what, what human rights were. She just knew that she wanted to act on behalf of women being subject to abuses in Yemeni jail, jails. Um, but she was told by Yemeni colleagues, listen, if you want to make an argument to the Yemeni government, you'd be well served to make reference to rights, to the treaty obligations to which the Yemeni government has signed on to. That will make your argument more powerful, more effective, more forceful. And so she started doing so, not, not for some sort of philosophical reason, not for theoretical reasons, but simply for practical reasons. Um, and that's how she came to be connected to Yemeni human rights networks, as well as Arab regional human rights networks, which is how we came to know, uh, to know each other. But I know, I know that's not a, a, a fancy justification for human rights. It's extremely simple. But I guess the question is, are the impulses behind pushes for human rights necessarily so complex, so academic as we, we sometimes make them. Quite often, it seems to me, it's just that social movements say, hey, this is a useful tool to advance our particular concerns, and nothing more than that. Um, but what about exclusions in human rights, of which there have always been many, and of which there, there remain many? Um, that's the, the second part of the, the, the tool of struggle, site of struggle uh, equation. Human rights as a site of struggle, a site of struggle in which social movements around the world in the process of claiming human rights are also redefining human rights so that they make sense to their particular struggles, be those around indigenous rights, intersex rights, or any of the, ra uh, any of the range of emerging rights issues that social movements have brought into the rights regimes in ways previously unimaginable to prior notions of what human rights uh, would be. That has little to do with any singular history, any singular origin story, some notion of particular philosophical or cultural tradition. 
um, slogan that, that I had up earlier from the U.S. Human Rights City Alliance is human rights don't trickle down, they rise up. And it's an expression of that exact same sentiment, that human rights can never be a predefined gift from a savior on high of some monolithic fixed idea of human rights. To move past the idea of human rights as a savior-like entity, a, a top-down gift, it was, to me, key to challenge this, this origin story notion and instead connect human rights' persistent power to churning and changing on-the-ground realities in terms of how human rights are being constructed and reconstructed in different ways. That's what allows them to resonate. And I, I remain convinced that human rights energy will continue to come from very diverse actors, from young people protesting in the streets of Chile or Colombia to attempt to overturn the elite status quo in those countries, to indigenous peoples leading resistance to state power and insisting on integrating environmental rights into human rights protections, to trans populations demanding a place in the protection, protections human rights can offer, et cetera. To those, in short, challenging from within the status quo political culture, both here in the US and in all parts of the world. So, speaking of all parts of the world, um, and going back to where I started, how did all this lead to work in Los Angeles, in the U.S., in Colombia? Um, so I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm trying to kind of intersect two trajectories here, right? One, in terms of phases of my career, beginning, middle, and I guess I should avoid the word end, but <laughs> current stage uh, of, of, of my career. Um, and, and secondly, how each of those have been defined by challenges to the status quo, challenges to the idea of human rights as culturally determined, irrelevant to the Middle East, false, challenges the notion of human rights defined by some foundational origin, false. And so the, this, this, this current phase of my uh, career and this, this last challenge to a status quo is the challenge to the state-centric nature of the human rights regime and the transitional justice regime as, as you see on the screen. So how to continue that story? Um, a few circumstances. One circumstance is, the, as I mentioned, the, the crushing of the Arab revolutions, which was frankly just personally depressing, even though it wasn't totally surprising. Um, but in academic terms, that made me think about transitional justice. The framing term, as you can read on screen, for processes that help societies transition to democracy from troubled past in ways that are more than just, let's have an election and, and move on. Um, the failure to engage in serious transitional justice processes, trials, truth commissions, et cetera, was, it seems to me, at least in part, responsible for the inability to sustain the change envisioned by those who participated in the Arab uprisings. So that was one, one circumstance. Um, a second one uh, is much more oxy-specific. Uh, Wendy mentioned the work of the Young Initiative in terms of a, a task force doing research um, with the uh, LA Mayor's Office. Those have mostly been focused on the Sustainable Development Goals, translating those global norms into local policy. And in, in conversations with city officials about that, I noted the interest of, of, of Brenda Shockley, LA's deputy mayor for economic opportunity, um, also chief equity officer, and of course, an Oxy grad, most importantly. Um, and Brenda was, was interested in, in some sort of truth and reconciliation process using the, the phrase from South Africa here in Los Angeles, which, which perked up my ears. It connected to my thinking about the weaknesses and failures of transitional justice, not just in um, not just in, in the Arab world, but also critiques of truth and reconciliation in, in South Africa and elsewhere. So it made a lot of sense, uh, at least to, to me, to take up the, the city, take up Brenda on this. His academic work at its really its best and most wondrous is really about constant reinvention. And this allowed that type of reinvention, an amazing opportunity to merge, on the one hand, thought on the Arab world that I just outlined, i.e. the need for the wish that there had been better thought out transitional justice processes in the wake of the Arab Spring with a commitment to work here in LA, particularly this is in the summer, uh, I'm not sure exactly when it was, but either right before or right after uh, the summer of, of Black Lives Matters protests uh, around the country and around the city. And so the idea of engaging with city and community groups on how to address this city's history of racialized exclusions was, was very, very appealing, very powerful. And later, that came to connect me back to Colombia and Latin America. That door that had been closed to me when I first started my master's studies opened up again at the end of a rather twisty path. But before getting to that, let me, let me stick to Los Angeles and truth in, in LA. Um, first thing I have to do is just thank the, the students. I see, I see um, one or two of you here. Um, you know, it says on here, uh, Anthony Trotta Chase, faculty lead, Occidental College. Um, and that, 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 that's really false. 
um, the, the students really led this project. They really inspired me during this project. Um, and, you know, I, I, I have to thank Caroline Diamond, who's here, Gaia Morales, who's here, um, but, but also other students who are part of the team, or really teams, because there are multiple teams, in terms of really just opening my own mind to, to new possibilities. So I'm, I'm really forever grateful for, for the student leadership in terms of, of, of those task force, and that's, that's not an exaggeration. Together, we interviewed, I think it was over 40 people, groups, uh, working in cities across the United States to initiate truth and accountability processes. And it was just incredibly exciting to see in a country which systematically turns its back on human rights, so much grassroots action demanding truth, demanding rights, demanding accountability, demanding repair, demanding reparations, and doing so in a way that challenges the walls in the U.S. against engaging with global norms such as human rights, such as, as truth commissions. So we developed a, a, a proposal for a, a truth process in L.A. that learned from activism around the world um, about truth and re reparations and also learned from, from activism around the country, mostly in, in small, um, small cities around, around this country. And, you know, I happen to think that our proposal, I'm biased, was, was quite innovative. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have one ally here, I know. Um, but it goes back to this notion of, of challenging the, the, the status quo. Um, truth commissions, this is the, the sort of standard definition of a, a truth commission um, written by Priscilla Hayner, but adopted as well by the United Nations. And it, you know what we came up with after going through all these interviews and all this work was urging a process that really contradicts each of these five supposed fundamental foundations of what a truth process should be. Um, focused on the past rather than ongoing events? No, to the contrary. It should be about current, ongoing exclusions, not some myth that we can just talk about past harms as if they don't have an impact on current realities. Um, has to be about events? No, to the contrary. It should be about underlying structures of power, structures that empower exclusion of particular populations. Um, third, that you know, there's this language, this sort of technocratic, top-down language, about engaging with affected populations as if they're a, a passive object. But know that these, these processes that are powerful, meaningful, really need to be owned by affected populations, not reached out to. Um, in terms of uh, there being necessarily temporary, why? To the contrary, if you just have a commission, a report, and you move on, what's going to happen? Obviously nothing. You need to have these, these institutions be, part, uh, be a continuing part of governance if they're going to have a powerful impact. And, and lastly, per this challenge I mentioned to the notion of state centrism, why does it have to be state authorized? Um, particularly when so often states are complicit in the harms at, at issue. So in short, what we came up with something that was critical, a lot of the traditional foundations of truth processes, and was based on what we termed recognition, responsibility, and, and repair. Um, recognition of, um, of past harms is a way to constitute a different story about our collective future responsibility taking for government complicity in past harms in a way that's not just about you know standard passive apologies for something that happened before I was born, but rather taking active responsibility to address current structural inequities that result from those past harms. And lastly, repair, that processes of recognition and responsibility can feed into holistic programs for reparations that are about structural change and very much based in human rights obligations as well as principles drawn from the sustainable development goals. So I, I thought it was pretty good. Caroline agrees with me. Um, <laughs> uh, but going back to, to what I said before about understanding human rights in an anti-foundational manner, the same is, is, is true here in terms of truth commissions. The key is, is not to have one model of truth commissions to apply from on high, but rather to continually reinvent those models of truth commissions, depending on local context and depending on grassroots engagement and ownership. Ours in LA is just one example of that sort of reinvention. And as we did work here in LA, I began doing something I'd long wanted to do, which was to connect my work to Columbia, more specifically to a really dynamic experiment in reinventing truth processes, which was going on in, uh, in Columbia. Um, so Columbia has its own violent history, as I'm sure most of you are undoubtedly aware of some of the figures on that in Spanish, but I think pretty easily uh, decipherable are, are, are up on, on the screen. Um, and in the midst of the, there was a peace agreement in 2016 uh, between the Colombian government and the FARC, Latin America's largest uh, guerrilla army, 
which had been engaged in the longest lasting uh, guerrilla war in the world. Um, and the, the implementation of that peace pact was, was somewhat troubled, but in response to that, Columbia is seeing a particularly creative, community-driven truth process. And as we worked in LA, I began to connect to a, a few people in Columbia as a way to learn from them, to borrow from them, is probably a more, more honest way to put it. Um, and even after we finished our Truth in LA proposal, that was something which I, I really wanted to continue pursuing, and, and partly just for, for personal reasons. And so, you know, I did so. And, and I was lucky to have both academic connections, Chandra Shiram, a, a mutual friend of, of, of David and I's, was uh, incredibly generous in connecting me to networks. Uh, she's a real expert on transitional justice. Uh, she connected me to experts in Colombia who are working on transitional justice there. And of course, it helped to be Colombian and have family and friends uh, who, who were insiders, or at least would help me help introduce me to, to a lot of the insiders, uh, both in terms of formal positions as well as people working at the community level. So it was really nice for a change to kind of be an insider and to be able to call people rather easily. Um, and um, that meant that I was able to engage both with officials working with the, the Truth Commission and the HEP, which is the Human Rights War Crimes Tribunal, um, and this slide is of the, the formal unveiling of the Truth Commission report, which was a major, major public event in, in, in Colombia last, uh, last August, I believe it was. Um, but most movingly powerful, um, thanks to a, a particularly energetic cousin of mine, I was, I was really able to engage with community-led truth processes in, uh, uh, across Colombia. And it's that community ownership and how it came to drive the official process that has made Columbia's truth process so different and, at least to me, so, so, so interesting. It's essential to have community engagement and ownership to move truth processes past, per what I mentioned before, past being just a rote, government-controlled, top-down, performative process, as it has been in too many cases. The, the key phrase used by these groups in Colombia to describe their work is hacer uh, memoria, a phrase that's used to summarize the project of these community-led truth processes across Colombia. And that literally translates to make memory or create memory, something like that. But I think it, it, it more properly means have agency over memory or, or take agency over memory. Take control of memory as a way to restructure, rethink who we are as a society, that, that making memory is a way to challenge historic narratives that define our societies, to re-narrate who and what is valued and who and what is excluded in those historic narratives. Haciendo uh, memoria, in short, is a way of saying reimagining our state societies through the voices of the traditionally marginalized. Um, and this, um, this image is from Casa de la Paz, <coughs> excuse me, in, in Bogota, place which is focused really more than anything else on reincorporating uh, ex parque um, but it's also a space for an Afro-transgender collective that is part of one of these community collective projects, a collective sewing project. Sewing projects are, are, are a key, have become a key symbol of this in, in, in Colombia to create a fabric to cover Bogota's Palace of Justice, which is uh, Bogota's, uh, Colombia's Palace of Justice is an important symbol of, of, of Colombia's conflict in, in 1985. Um, it was seized by a Colombian rebel group, M19, uh, of which the current president, Pedro, was a part. And in storming the palace to take it back, the military didn't just kill everyone they could, but they did, uh, guerrillas as well as state employees. But they were also spotted escorting out officials, including uh, Supreme, uh, Supreme, uh, Supreme Court justices, alive. Um, many of these people were never seen from again, i.e. They were, they were disappeared. Um, and that's... That's really the, the, the essence here, going back to the, the, the previous slide. Um, in, a, in a literal sense, bring out the truth of past histories, bring attention to those past histories of systemic human rights violations. But two, and I think more importantly, to use that telling of a past history as a way to challenge dominant histories that exclude subaltern populations from the stories of what that society is. Um, you know, what it's saying here is you know, a, a, a symbolic act um, to, uh, to, 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 to cover the palace of justice with our stories, right? These are not stories of high-level government officials. These are stories of people who have been disappeared um, in different parts of, of the country. So therefore, you're, you're taking one story of disappearances and translating it into a more inclusive story um, 
about the, the disappearances, uh, the displacements that have been part of Columbia's uh, last 50 years of, of history. Um, and let me just uh, show one other set of, of images about these collective sewing projects. This about um, you know uh, dolls sewn by mothers of, of children killed during 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 conflict, which is rather heartbreaking. Um, but it's striking to me how that collective sewing project to commemorate deaths of one's own children can also be part of a positive, forward-looking project to use for the sign uh, that's to the right there, uh, which is from a different site entirely from for Egypt. A, a site of memory, um, but which can be translated to memory to transform sorrow into hope, death into life, impunity into justice. Um, and oddly, I think, uh, I was reading the New Yorker recently, I saw this quote from Janelle Monet, which I think puts it really well. I mean, she, she wasn't really the source I expected for that. Um, but, um, you know, the memory of, of, of who we've been, of who we've been punished for being, was always the only map uh, into tomorrow. I think that's really beautifully put. And so all that's a, a long introduction into what goes on into my next project, uh, the official title of which is Bringing Truth Home, Local Global Lessons for How to Create Social Cultural Transformation in the U.S. You might want to work on that title. Um, <laughs> and of course, I, I, I should say that when I say it's my next project, I think one has to write something before officially claiming it's a project. So we'll see if that really is. But it's the idea, anyway. It's the idea of a project. And the puzzle in that project is that while it's not difficult in an academic setting to argue abstractly that a pluralist, human rights-informed conception of political community is an obvious antidote to nationalist fires raging across the globe. It's a lot more difficult in reality. The difficult puzzle is how to create emotional support for abstract theories of human rights-based pluralist politics. That's the real challenge in the puzzle that I hope to explore, very much learning from and connecting to work on truth commissions. Um, in terms of how to create this inclusive social cultural fabric based in human rights that resonates in ways that are not just rationally relevant, but also emotionally powerful. To do that, we have to learn from each other, including here in the US, this most insular of countries. We need to begin learning from other parts of the world, including Colombia, um, which connects to something that was written in the foreword to the last book uh, I was a part of. Um, and when thinking of a, of a through line in terms of my own work, you know, I, I found it when I uh, in a certain sense, when I read this in the foreword from uh, Cesar Rodriguez Garavito, who's the former head of De Justicia in Bogota, uh, and we've been working on the, the book to which this is an introduction for a long time. I wrote a chapter, wrote a couple introductions, um, and then I, we got the foreword from, from Cesar, and I was like, dang, I wish I'd, <laughs> I wish I'd written that. Um, <laughs> this, 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 this puts the project of the book, but also really, I think, the project of my career better than, than, than I ever have. Um, so specific to the project I was talking about, what he's saying about the globalization of the vernacular, more simply put, is that it includes the possibility for communities to learn from other communities across the globe, not necessarily mediated by states, not necessarily mediated by international organizations. Specific to the question of how to build emotionally resonant, pluralistic communities, the argument I plan to make connects to that quote. It's that these Colombian experiments in this domain are fertile expressions of the possibilities of truth and accountability processes to develop powerful forms of community, of community building and rights claiming as a way to confront exclusion and build new forms of inclusive identity and through that more pluralistic open societies. It may be that just as Colombians are learning from truth processes in other parts of the world and transforming them as they do so, they in turn can help inform how US communities can expand their vocabulary for how to enact justice in ways that powerfully speak to the U.S.'s uniquely difficult history and particularly fractured current politics. As, as Laura Martin argues, that's not, uh, justice is not something that happens to or for people, but rather is enacted by individuals and communities. The U.S., as we all know, has an insular history regarding human rights. It's also a country with a particularly urgent need to learn from human rights and foreign practice in other parts of the globe. Um, so one last thing uh, before, I, before I leave you. This is the book from which that quote Quote was taken, uh, co-edited with, with friends and, and partners, including Sophia. Um, so it turns out that I didn't actually leave her field as much as I tried. Um, so the, the, the book included a section uh, indicated on the right on, on, on um, human rights at the sub-state level, including cities. Um, you know, and unfortunately in the US, we don't have a federal government willing to take human rights seriously. But again, it raises this question, why does this have to be mediated by the state? 
You know, that's certainly the traditional legal conception, the traditional conception in human rights. The chapters in this section make the theoretical argument that cities can act more like city-states of really the not-so-distant past. That is, Michael Goodhart, one of the authors in the section, puts it, the future of human rights is local, not international. That in a world of nation-states that are increasingly nationalistic, increasingly hostile to global norms, cities can be the center of real implementation of human rights policies that address issues that intersect the global and the local as so many urgent issues do. So LA has been obviously an innovator in that and really been happy to, to partner with LA, uh, but also hoping to, to push further um, in terms of that work. And, and that obviously connects to the work of the US Human Rights Cities Alliance, to which I referred earlier. Um, our push is to advance two processes, adoption of human rights treaties at local levels and reporting to global ne uh, mechanisms across cities um, in the United States. And we actually just had a great workshop here at Occidental with guests both from uh, LA city government, also from other parts of, of, of the country, um, most specifically Atlanta, whose city council recently worked with us in declaring itself via resolution a human rights city, um, and where I'll be participating in May in the summit to discuss what does that mean? How do we put meat on the bones of that sort of resolution? What are the sorts of tangible policy change that can flow out of, of, of that type of resolution? Those are answers that have to emerge uh, that don't already exist. Um, so I'm anxious to find out what those answers are. Um, and that's really the last of the three challenges I wanted to highlight. You know, moving from challenging state-centric truth processes to, with the city's project, challenging the state centrism of the human rights regime in general. It isn't, of course, to say that nation states have become magically unimportant. But if we're to conceptualize human rights as dynamic and changing, part of that can be, I think, at least in, in, in some sense, untethering them from being necessarily state-centric and allowing action outside of the context of states. So let me, let me end by returning to uh, the opening quote, A Thousand Lies Out of Which We Choose One. Actually, as I think this, this, this uh, story uh, indicates, we choose many more than, than, than just one. One door opens the path to other doors, leads to opening up interconnections from the Arab world to Colombia to LA to the US, whatever it might be. Um, but it returns, it returns me to the metaphor of walls with which I started. You know, and this obviously is, 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 is the Berlin Wall. Walls become this unfortunate symbol of our time. You know, I've tried to talk about breaking down academic walls, but that's part of a much broader project. I was uh, reminded last week by a student who was just in, in Berlin for her, her, her spring break that you know, I was there too a long time ago before this wall was torn down, which is to say I'm, I'm old. Um, but it reminded me when she, she brought that up that, that that moment of the Berlin Wall being ripped down was a tangible moment of hope, of an opening in the world. And sadly, per, per this graph, 77 walls have been built between countries, most of them built in the last two decades. There's 15 more of them in planning uh, beyond, beyond these that are shown. From Israel to India, from the West Bank to San Diego, uh, to Texas within our own walls, intellectual and physical. I'm under no illusion that my academic career is anything but the smallest of footnotes to all of this. Um, the academic door I chose is, is a very small one, but for what it's worth, I do think academic work matters, and I hope in some small way the work that we all do collectively continues to challenge the status quo. In short, we should continue trying to break down intellectual walls um, in ways that can also help break down the psychic and physical borders that narrow our vision of what's possible in our shared world. And so in the spirit of breaking through walls, I'll, I'll leave you with this image of dogs doing what we should all be doing. Um, I thank you all so much for, for listening. Thank <laughs> you.